Charles, welcome. Sorry. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. I know you've got a busy day yeah. at the festival. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your journey in education. Oh, it's convoluted. Well, I started off as a secondary science teacher uh, and worked in a comprehensive school for five years and, and then in an independent selective boys school, interestingly, and then I've ended up in special education. I've worked in three types of special schools over the last 10 years and now as a head teacher. Um, so I arrived in special education a little bit by accident. I, think I took a leap in the dark to go and work in a school for boys with behavioural difficulties. Mm. And I think we come with lots of people who work in special schools once you get into that sector it becomes a yeah it consumes you yeah it just takes in over a good you. way absolutely right yeah no question but it, it uh, um you can't be anything other than give 100 percent to those kids because their life outcomes are are poor by comparison to the rest of the population so you see that on a daily basis both through how it manifests itself with the children how they struggle as adults the effect on their parents um, so it's very easy to have a very strong moral purpose about what you're doing in special schools because the difficulties the students face are, are overt and they're in front of you all the time. And you write. You write a lot. You're a prodigious writer and uh, talker uh, around these issues. Yeah, only recently really actually. I've, I've had strong opinions for years which is ultimately what led me to become a head teacher. I, I, having opinions and not being able to do anything about it was frustrating so I felt I should put my money where my that's mouth the, is. That's the route to leadership then. No question, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but actually feeling like I should I should put my opinions on the line of my principles to the test and see if that works. Um, and then in the last couple of years becoming feeling that writing is an outlet for that. Uh, and, and I've got a book coming out in September called Don't Send Him In Tomorrow about children with learning difficulties and the, and the outcomes they face in, in, in life. And a colleague was asking me a few, few weeks ago, how, how long did it take you to write a book? And I said, it, it took me three weeks. And he said, that's really short. And I said, well, actually, it took 15 years to write, but it took three weeks to type, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. once someone suggested that I think about writing one, basically, it just all came out, all the experience that I've had, that I've, uh, that I've seen children and parents go through. It was all in there somewhere. It just needed a bit of an outlet, and, and it just all came out in one go into hopefully a coherent narrative about, about kids with learning difficulties in this country. Is the coherent narrative, is it one of optimism or is it one of pessimism? Uh, well, it, it can be easy to be pessimistic when you look at the life outcomes for, for children with learning difficulties, but actually special schools in this country, they're the envy of the world. People move to this country to get their child into a special school. Which, you know, so people sometimes move down the road or they pay 50 grand extra for a house to get into the right catchment. Some people are moving across the world to go to special schools in this country. I remember a specific example is in my book about her. There's a Russian girl I used to, to, to work with and her, her mum moved to this country in order for her to go to school because they lived in Moscow. And she didn't speak, she had autism, and she simply wouldn't have gone to school there. So she upped sticks and moved hundreds and hundreds of miles across the continent to, to, to send her to a school. And I remember her grandfather, who didn't speak any English, coming to our school. The mum said, can you, show, can you show him round? And we did, and he, he pretty much cried the whole way round. And it struck me actually that what we do, we just take for granted, is not available to many people in the world actually. And so we should be proud of that. And we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not and at why all. Why not? There's no. There's very little public discourse, isn't there, about look, special education needs yeah. provision is, as you say, world class. Is that too well, overblown? I think, it's, I think it's exceptional. I think it's the the envy of many countries in the world. When it works. Yeah, absolutely right, of course, yeah, and um, that's not to say every single school in the country is great, because far from it, but actually our track record is really good, uh, and that's entirely down, it's not to do with money, There's, I haven't got any fancy kit in my school that any other school doesn't have, just got a school that's set up with people who give everything they've got to those kids and try their best to understand the child and everything about them, and work really closely with the parents, because the thing for me is, when I talk about those outcomes for children, many of the children I work with are unaware of those and are simply not interested. But that sits in the gut of that parent all the time. What is my child going to be able to do when I'm not around anymore? And that's a, you know, my children are seven and ten and they don't, they live in the work independently. Well, they better do, but you know, at some point, whether they can afford to or not, it's a different matter. I've long since stopped worrying about whether that's going to be the case for them. But for the parents I work with, that never leaves them. It's in their gut the whole time, actually. So we've got a sense in the Education Foundation that's what, what's special about SEN provision as well, is that, that there's a, a team around the child yeah. and a team with different skills, different capabilities, but it's that team approach, it's that 
well, I think you have to call it child-centred. Yeah, it, it can't be anything other than that. And that's a loaded term in, in, in some Indeed. parts of our landscape, isn't it? But it can't be anything other than that. You've got, there's no point working on whatever the year two curriculum says if that child isn't at that level. I've got 16, 17-year-old children in my school that struggle with a number bonds to 10 or write their own name. We could pretend otherwise, but that's a fact. So you have to start from where the child is at. You can try trigonometry if you want. You're wasting your time. You must start where that child is at. And they have many difficulties that surround them that, that mean they struggle to, to learn well unless you get those right. Sensory processing issues, communication difficulties, social care issues. And they, if we don't address them, they are simply not in a place to learn. So we, we are, because it's overt, we see that and we, we, we are dealing with it. Strikes me too, having been involved in SEN policy and lo looking at the, the politics of various situations. It ne never seems to change around SEN. It's always ongoing review of this, review of that. Um, how does that feel in, in a school and as a school leader? So I've spent the last two weeks with my deputy head doing annual reviews of our children's EHCPs, their, their statements, and we've done probably 50, I would say, and there's been a lot of reform in the last two years around the SEN system and it's cost half a billion pounds. We were reflecting with parents and, and ourselves at the end of two weeks. There is simply no change to the system at all operationally. And that's a damning indictment of the reform because it may well have had laudable aims, but in terms of its delivery and what it's done for parents and children and teachers in schools, it's just cost the Exchequer half a billion pounds and that's it. Uh, and that's unfortunate. People feel the need to tinker with that without actually addressing the root causes of those issues. Um, and there's a, I call it a bone-crushing bureaucracy that surrounds it. I find it very difficult to navigate the system and I work in it. And parents are probably going through that once and once only. They find it impenetrable and they find it oppositional. Uh, and all they want to do is be satisfied that we are doing the best we can for their child. And it's, it's hard for them to feel that if they feel the weight of the system hinders that really. So often your role as a leader is to, to protect your school, protect your staff f from that system ironically. Yeah uh, we can do that actually we're, we're I'm, I'm in a fortunate position where the, the two Wednesday evenings in August I'm not lying awake thinking am I going to get fired because my A-level or GCSE results aren't right. I don't have that you know I, I'm, I'm accountable in the same Ofsted framework as every other head teacher and I'm perfectly happy for that but I, I'm not driven by the the end point narrative, if you like, the end of key stage tests that can end up with head teachers losing their job. I don't have that. And I, uh, there's a freedom that we have in special schools to feel like we can do what is the best thing for that child. I can ignore all the stuff about the EBAC. I'm not interested in that. I can just dismiss it and do what I know is best for the 117 kids in my school. So what keeps you going as a professional? Uh, uh, well, you can come into school in a bad mood if sometimes or if I'm a bit knackered or whatever and then within about four seconds of meeting any child in my school, they don't care, they're not interested. Like, it was a classic... They're not in your bad mood. No, they're <laughs> not. It was a great example of, um, uh, of this last week. I'm gonna, I, I hate singing but I'm going to sing a little bit and this is very unusual for me to do that with some strangers and a camera pointing at me but I'll do it. And uh, there's a girl in year seven, she's a great kid and she, uh, I walked through the hall and I said, morning Kira," and she just sidled past me and went, you don't own me and just walked off and it was hilarious i just cracked up uh, and she's not interested in my workload or whatever and uh, when i when i have interactions like that i realize that's what i'm about you know that those kids need a group of committed people to make sure that they are successful adults really um, and they are relentlessly optimistic the kids so i have a duty to be the same really good luck with your book appreciate it thank you very much for your time no problem. Really Anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank time. you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Anytime.